such a beautiful day. You're welcome, our YouTube audience as well. We're live on both YouTube and Facebook this afternoon. Welcome to Refreshing Time. This is your host, as Little Rev, Rosie Noah. I'm excited to be here on today's episode. It's going to be an awesome, awesome time in God's presence as we get into the Word of God. If you're on, come on, invite somebody to join us. This is Refreshing Time. I'm here to inspire you. I'm here to equip you with the Word of God. I'm here to what um, empower you so that you can influence your families, your friends, your society. You can be a blessing to this generation and the world at large. And so welcome again to my program today, Refreshing Time. The word of God says times of refreshing will come from the presence of God. And so if you're here today, certainly and definitely you will be refreshed to the glory of God. Amen. And amen. This is your host, says and speaker, literary Rosie Noah here. This is what I do every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and I'm, I always come looking forward to be of a great blessing to you to impact your life and somebody else's life. Please share with somebody on your WhatsApp platform, on Facebook, anywhere you can share, invite people to come. Uh, we are treating a very important topic Everywhere you look right now on social media, everybody's trying to talk about the same thing. Uh, I believe when God gave me this um, word about three months ago, he said, I will need you to go out and teach and, and, and get people to understand the end times and what, what is about to happen. And of course, I stepped up because God said I should. So I definitely came out here and started the series. So maybe this is your first time of watching. If you've missed any of the episodes, don't worry. We've recorded all of them. They're on YouTube and then Facebook. On YouTube, you'll find my page, Rev Rosie Noah. Uh, you find me on the R-O-S-I-E, Rosie. Rev Rosie Noah. You find me on YouTube. And you can catch up on all the episodes that probably you've uh, missed out. Also, we have a website, www.refreshingtime.info. When you get on that page, that's a website for the Refreshing Time program. And um, there's a tab on their page that says Word Library. You want to get on that page, you can access it with your email or whatever social media login you have. And all the series that we've treated in end times is there. All the end time series are there, I believe. Um, Maybe you might be missing if you're looking for the teaching notes for episode 44. All that in episode 45 this week will be loaded um, before the end of the week on there. But definitely you can access the Facebook uh, recording link, YouTube recording link, and the teaching notes. These are the notes that I teach in here. You know, if you're like me, you like a visual. Okay, some people like to follow. They want to read. They want to go back. They want to um, check out the word of God. So maybe you are that person. As so I would just encourage you today um, to get a hold of those teaching notes and follow as I teach the word of God. We give God praise for that. And so if you haven't done that, go to www.refreshingtime.info and get acquainted with the word of God, share with others, teach it to others. And I believe you also will be a blessing to somebody else. Amen. All right. So let's look at today's episode. Today's episode. Yes. Good afternoon, my sister over there. Good afternoon, Liz. Love you. Appreciate you coming on time or every time. Uh, most of the time, of course, you're always here to support the work of God. God richly bless you. Share with others to come on. Today's episode number 45. Episode 45. We are continuing here with the end time series. We looked at the Holy Trinity. We looked at the dragon. We looked at the Antichrist or Antichrist. And we're looking at the false prophet. So episode 44 was a false prophet the intro of it, but we lay the foundational teaching on the prophetic ministry. Because if you don't know what the prophetic ministry is or who a prophet or prophetess is, I don't know if you'll be able to figure out who this false prophet is. So we have to kind of build up. I wish I could just go in and say, okay, boom, boom, boom. Here's the false prophet. Let's move on. But if I do that and I've done you a disservice, I believe in equipping people with the word of God, give them all the information they need so they can think for themselves. They can discern by the help of the Holy Spirit and get to know what is truth and what is a lie. Praise God. So that's why I'm going through the pains of doing this. Believe you me, I'm like, man, can we just get to the other part of it? But I can't skip. I can't. I can't just cut corners. I have to do my due diligence. And so I thank God. Believe you me, for episode 44, 45, I'm like, God, give me the strength to do this. Anoint me, empower me. Let me be able to speak the word of God in boldness and open the eyes of people to understand the prophetic. All right. So, um, because I am in a prophetic ministry, I understand what the prophetic ministry is. I've gone around prophets and prophetesses. And so not only do I have 
you know, theoretical knowledge, head knowledge, but I have hands on experience. Praise God. That's important because then you'll be able to, you know, give good concrete examples and help people to understand when we are talking about the prophetic ministry. So if you miss episode 44, it's very critical. Please get to it, get some of the foundational teachings there so that as we continue today in episode 45, it will make so much sense to you as we build on it. Glory be to God. Again, like I said last week, if you plan to go to Bible school. We do have the DCI Bible Institute. We have three schools in there. We have the School of Ministry, School of Worship, and School of Prophets. If you want to specialize in the prophetic ministry, you attend the School of Prophets, okay? And even if you don't have the call to be a prophet or prophetess, I encourage you to do that. Just get knowledge, obtain knowledge, because knowledge is power. Praise God. Anyways, so in today's episode 45, we are looking at end time series, the false prophet part number two, and we are continuing to lay the foundation. Today we are looking in here, we'll be talking about prophets and prophetesses in the Bible, um, both in the Old and New Testament. We're going to look at some examples and we will attempt to look at some false prophets in the Bible. That's a whole huge topic. Believe me, all of episode um, 46, part three, whoo, it's going to be awesome. All kinds of things, because I want people to know so they are not deceived. Amen. So let's start. Episode 45. Father, we thank you for today. I thank you for those listening. I thank you for what you're about to do today. I give you all the praise, all the glory. I thank you, God. We cover the network with the blood of Jesus. Speak to us. Speak through us. Oh, God, use me to be, oh, God, a blessing to somebody listening today. Holy Spirit, convict those who, oh, God, are uh, practicing evil. Convict those who are walking in sin. Convict them, oh, God, to repent and give your heart to Jesus Christ. Christ, uh, the son of the living God. And I pray today, Holy Spirit, put over my words. Let people's eyes be open. Let them come and know and discern the, the true prophetic and the false prophetic. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Okay. All right. So let's get into it. Don't be surprised if you see me put on my glasses today because every now and then I need it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, so we are looking at examples of, so we, we ended up 40, um, episode 44 looking at the prophetic, um, how the prophetic ministry looks like and all that we talked about, the spirit of prophecy, gift of prophecy, the office of a prophet. And today I want us to look at some things here in the Bible. God bless you. Okay, is the line clear? Is the video good? Sound is good? Yes. Hallelujah. We thank God for that. Amen. So, uh, well, let's take a look at, you know, these are just things maybe you should have known, or if not, you're just getting to know. When you look at the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, or the Old Testament, as some of us call it, um, there, there are different books that are written there, okay? There, there are books in there, both for the Old Testament and the New Testament. But because we are treating the false prophet and later foundation, teaching on who prophets and prophetesses are, um, I'm just going to focus on that aspect, okay? So in the Old Testament or the Tanakh, um, there are lots of prophets who did great and marvelous things that God used them in their generation. But when we talk of prophetic books, like books that talk about, you know, um, prophets who uh, wrote extensively, prophets who have extensive work um, for what they did, we, we categorize them as major prophets. Listen, in our time and age, this century, you might hear somebody say, I am a major prophet. I am a minor prophet, major this, major that. Okay. I'm not against any of them. Okay. But that's not what I'm talking about. We don't call you a major prophet because you think you are more anointing than somebody else or minor prophet because you are insignificant. Does it make sense? Okay. A prophet is a prophet. Prophetess is a prophetess. If you want to call yourself prophetess one, prophetess 1000, whatever the name is, that's on you. But as far as we are concerned, biblically, according to Ephesians 4, 8 to 16 or 8 to 11, specifically when it talks about the fivefold ministry, he said, Jesus gave gifts. He didn't say, I gave major gifts, major, uh, major prophet, minor prophet. Jesus didn't do that. Okay. He just said apostles, prophet, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. So as I'm teaching it today, uh, don't get it confused if you hear somebody call themselves a minor prophet or a major prophet in our time. But in the Bible days, we acknowledge and recognize four major prophets in the Bible. Okay, some of them, you might not even see the enemy. You're like, what happened to them? We'll get there. So the four major prophets, because their books are extensive, their work is extensive, the, the prophetic uh, things they release in their time is way extensive than the other people. That's the reason why. Um, so the first one we know, not they are not in, uh, you know, in, in order of importance, but... Um, 
the first prophet I'm going to talk about is um, the prophet Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah. Um, even recently in our generation, it hasn't been long, not a few years back, they discovered the, um, the, the Qumran um, rolls, okay, or Dead Sea Scrolls, if you want to call up, uh, talk about it. And of course, they even discovered more of what the prophet Isaiah wrote that didn't even make it in the Bible. Can you believe it? <laughs> more of those, more scrolls. OK, because back then they wrote on papyrus, they wrote on these sheets, they wrote scrolls. It wasn't like the Bible. The Bible is just not maybe what, not too long, a few years ago, centuries ago, if you would put it, that it was put um, in a, in the regular way that we know, like categorized by chapters and verses and whatnot. You will learn that in bibliography if you attend Bible school. I teach that class. That's an awesome class. But definitely, um, you know, there were no scrolls and all these um, sheets over the years, papyrus, like I said. And so there are some scrolls that didn't make it into the Bible, we know. But it doesn't negate the fact that it's to the word of God. Yes, we know the universal church canonized certain books and certain, um, you know, scriptures. So some were left out and some were added. We are not even arguing about that today. But that's another conversation for another day. <laughs> okay. All right. So we have the prophet Isaiah. We have the prophet Jeremiah. Everybody knows him as the, the weeping prophet. Oh, you're always weeping over Israel. We have the prophet Ezekiel. I like Ezekiel. Like you, you have to love that book. Okay. And of course, the prophet Daniel. So we know about these four major prophets. It doesn't change the fact that in the Old Testament, we have people like Abraham. God refers to him as his prophet. Uh, Moses was a major prophet. God used to deliver the children of Israel. Okay. Um, Elijah called on fire. Elisha did a double of what Elijah did. The prophet Samuel, his words never felt to the ground. He even anointed kings into place. So, you know, though all of them were prophets, they did great things for God. However, when we're talking of, if you hear someone say the major four, the four major prophets of the Old Testament, they're talking about Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Praise God. And of course, the minor prophets, their works is not like as extensive as the other major prophets. Um, you will find them like Amos. The book of Amos is really like a short book. You can easily read that. Habakkuk, Haggai, Hosea, Joel, Jonah, okay, Malachi, Micah, Nahum, Obadiah, Zechariah, and Zephaniah. These are, it's almost like 12 or like, like 12, 12 prophets over there, okay? So if you familiarize yourself with these books in the Bible, you get to understand the prophetic, what God was doing with them. All of them had unique prophetic ministries. God used them differently. God spoke to them differently. They all operated in a different dimension, praise God. And so um, I hope and believe, this is just a quick like touch and touch base and let's go. Just so you know, FYI, okay? I'm not going to details over there. If not, we'll never finish this end time series and get to the real meat and potatoes of who the false prophet is. Now, in the Old Testament, the reason why I want to spend a lot of time talking about prophetesses is because in our day, people negate the office of women in ministry. You know, they want to um, cast aside prophetesses or, you know, pastors and whatnot because they would always misquote what Paul said in the word of God and put their own twist and their own opinion. I tell people, exegete the word of God. Don't, don't do eisegesis, okay? E-I-S-C, don't, uh, E-I-S-E-G-S-I-S. -S. Don't do eisegesis. You put your own spirit an opinion on the word of God, but do an exegesis. Draw, let it draw out. Let the word of God itself speak to you. Stop misinterpreting scriptures. I've seen several videos, maybe on social media. Women can be preachers. Women can do this. Women can be pastors. Women can be prophetesses. Listen, stop listening to those lies. Maybe after the end time series, we'll get to something like that. Talk about it so that people can be aware and well informed. Glory be to God. Okay. If I'm talking too fast, let me know, because I have a habit of doing that either because I'm excited or because I'm trying to watch the time and get ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. So if I'm going too fast, it's slow down. Slow down, River Rose. It's slow down. Okay. All right. So because of that reason, we are looking at women in scripture, both in the Tanakh, which is the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament and in the New Testament, who were called into ministry. In fact, women have served in several roles in the Bible. Women have been uh, seen as leaders, singers, ministry helpers, evangelists, teachers, prophets, as you mentioned, it. women have been there. I always use this example and tell people the first, you know, we always say the first woman evangelist is the woman of the whale. The, the Samaritan woman, after Jesus had told her all these things about her, the Bible says she went into the city and proclaimed that she's met the Messiah. She's met the, uh, the son of God. She's met the man who told him everything about him herself and began to talk about Jesus. Listen, when Jesus resurrected from the dead, who are the first people to see him? Okay, Mary Magdalene, out of whom he cast out how many demons? Seven demons. Guess what? 
He said, go and tell my disciples, go and proclaim the resurrection. Come on, somebody. So if women were not relevant, if we were not important, Jesus wouldn't have even engaged us. In the ministry of Jesus, a lot of women were helping and supporting his ministry. Now, because in those times in the Jewish um, society, women were really not um, you know, recorded or put in a place of significance. So anytime maybe there was a woman, they either left it out or maybe left her name out, or even when your names were mentioned, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go into detail. One example, when it said Jesus fed the 5,000 men, it was men. Okay. Women and children not counting. <laughs> okay. So, so they didn't even put that in there. So just so you know, do not get it twisted and think women cannot fulfill the fivefold ministry. We know for a fact, because even at the resurrection, we were sent out. Glory be to God. Amen. So let's look at the Old Testament. The Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. One, the first the first prophet I'd like to bring to your attention so that you know that there were women who've gone ahead of you is the prophetess Miriam. Prophetess Miriam uh, was the sister of Moses and Aaron. Aaron was the priest. Aaron, Moses was the prophet. She was also a prophetess. Okay. And she had a music ministry with her prophet, prophetic ministry. She was sing and, and, and play the tambourine and gather all the people and they will follow her and they will give God worship. Of course, she was a prophetess. You know, obviously, from encounter we read about her, Aaron, and Moses when God called them and summoned them because Miriam spoke against Moses' prophetic ministry. God said, I'm a church all of you dreams but Moses I talked to him face, face to face guess what she was she was um smart with leprosy and they had to keep her for seven days and they kept the whole camp of Israel standing waiting for her to be healed back from that leprosy because God wanted to teach her you cannot use authority don't think you're also a prophetess and you can speak against the one I've chosen also a prophet to lead my people so let's be careful let's learn a lesson there you may be called into ministry but do not put your mouth on a man or a woman of God a prophet or a prophetess of God uh, because you don't you, because you don't want to confirm or affirm the ministry or calling because you don't like them because you think oh why why would they qualify for God to use them or call them God can use anybody I keep telling people God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise you think you are anointed you think you qualify because you have triple T a PhD in theology and God knows what and you under you understand it Elijah and Elijah put together listen God can use anybody God looks at the heart if God wants to use somebody as his prophet or prophetess, please respect that office, honor that office. If not, you'll be fighting God. You'll be fighting the anointing. You are fighting God's anointed. Don't do that. Okay, so maybe I'm talking to you. You are maybe a prophet or a prophetess in the making. Don't look down on yourself and think, maybe I'm not like the world known prophetesses or prophets out there. Let me, just as you are, God loves you. Just as you are, God wants to use you. Just as you are, God has anointed you to be a prophetess and a prophet, even in your own family line, your own bloodline, because a prophetic voice must be lifted in that family to restore the glory of God the God actually ordained for your ministry. So maybe you are the one. You are the one to say, I receive it. Take it in Jesus. And some of you are prophets or prophetesses, but nobody has even affirmed it. You are not sure until you meet another prophet or prophetess or a man of God who will look at you and by God's revelation, tell them this has been called into the prophetic ministry. I've ordained this person to be an apostle, teacher, evangelist, pastor, you name it. So prophetess Miriam, we're talking about, she was a prophetess when you can, you can find her in Exodus chapter 15, 20 to 21. The second prophetess we want to talk about, I'm just touching base. I'm not going into details into their lives. You will learn that in Bible school or in your Bible study. Amen. The second prophetess is prophetess Deborah. Deborah, when you read Judges chapter 4, 4 to 5, or the whole Judges chapter 4, in fact, it talks about Deborah. It says Deborah was judge. Look, imagine in our day and age, a judge, somebody who serves maybe what could be the Supreme Court, who knows? But Deborah, Deborah was a judge. She was judging the entire nation of Israel to rise up, sit, you know, sit down, and begin to judge the people and judge cases. She was a judge. That was her career. That was her profession. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So that was Deborah. The Bible says she was a wife. She was the wife of Lapidus. She was a wife, a married woman. A married woman. She was a mother. Come on, somebody. So we, we hear about the, uh, the prophetess Deborah in the Bible. She helped the uh, Barak, the commander of Israel's army, to defeat, um, you know, Caesarea and all those um, armies that were coming against them. Caesarea was a commander of the opposition army. Glory be to God. And so the Bible says God used Deborah, a prophetess. 
She spoke the prophetic word to Barak. He said, if I go, he said, uh, Barak said, I'm not going to know what without you, prophet. I said, I'm going with you. He said, if I go, they'll give me that credit. He said, no problem. I don't care who gets the credit. Just come with me and speak the prophetic word and let God use you to give this army prophetic directions and how to go and where to go. So we know about the prophet Deborah. You can be a career woman, a professional woman, and also be used by God as a prophet or a prophetess. Number three, we have the uh, Isaiah's wife. The prophet Isaiah's wife was also a prophetess. Yes. So the prophet married to a prophetess. Isn't that powerful? I think that's very powerful. Glory be to God. Because when you read Isaiah chapters uh, 8, verse 3, the Bible talks about that Isaiah knew his wife, the prophetess. Her name is not mentioned. It was only put in scripture that the Isaiah went into the prophetess, his wife, and conceived and had a son. And of course, the rest is history. Um, another prophetess in the Old Testament, or the Tanakh, is the prophetess Huda, H-U-L-D-A-H, -H, Huda. Uh, she was the wife of Shalom. Um, Shalom uh, basically had his wife. He was not in ministry himself, but his wife, um, Huda, was a prophetess. And the Bible says she was very knowledgeable in the law, in the Torah, in the scriptures. Praise God. And she had a very strong prophetic mantle to the point that she gave counsel to King Josiah. Come on, think about it. She gave counsel to the king. They could have gone for the high priest. They could have called anybody else, but they went to prophetess Huda because she walked in a very strong prophetic unction with the wisdom of God. I pray for watching today and desiring the prophetic office. God will locate you. God will anoint you. God will call you forth to be his mouthpiece in these last days. Amen. So you find her story in 2 Kings chapter 22, 8 to 13, 2 Kings 22, 15 to 20. It's in the teaching notes, by the way, and 2 Chronicles 34 to 28. Amen. Now, so at least we know offices out there that we have to know. We're talking about women who are called into the prophetic ministry. Um, her, name, her name was Prophetess Noadiah. Noadiah was a false prophet in a way because she joined, uh, if you have had Tobias and Sambalat, if you remember, they were opposing Nehemiah from rebuilding. Okay, so this prophetess, Noadiah, um, opposed Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 5, verse 14. So she, we don't talk about her in a positive way as uh, a true, authentic um, genuine prophetess of God, but she um, she basically opposed anything. Anybody that opposes the work of God, obviously you're on the opposite end. Okay, so that was prophetess Noadiah. So at least I've told you five different prophetesses from the Old Testament, right? Prophetess Miriam, mm -hmm. prophetess Deborah, okay, uh, prophet uh, Isaiah's wife, the prophetess, and prophetess Huda. Okay, we got it, and of course the false prophet. Prophetess Nodaya. So with that example alone, I want you to understand that women were called into the prophetic ministry in the Old Testament as well. Now let's look at something here. We're still looking at a prophetic ministry. Now that we've looked at the Old Testament, we've known the four major prophets, some of the prophets out there, some of the women prophetic ministry. I want, I think I made a little mention of it in episode 44, that Jesus was and is um, a priest, a high priest, okay, a prophet and a king. He fulfilled all the three in the Torah, in the, um, the Old Testament, or the Tanakh. They respected a high priest a lot. They respected kings a lot. They respected prophets a lot. Jesus fulfilled all that in his earthly ministry. So, um, quickly, I'm touching base on it quickly. That I won't go through all the scriptures that are listed. I'm gonna read one or two here and there. Okay. Number one, Jesus um, became our our great high priest. He's a high priest. What did the high priest do in the Old Testament or the Tanakh? They went into the Holy of Holies once a year. They offered atonement. Everybody brought their, their lambs without blemish, okay? Uh, they sacrificed them and, you know, it atoned for the sins of your family. They didn't wipe it away. It kind of swept it under the rag. Okay, and so the high priest will go into the Holy of Holies and the tone and ask God. And when they're going in, they have something tied around their waist, um, a little bells, you know, around um, their rope that can come all the way out because nobody can enter into the Holy of Holies. And, and you know, little bells, you know, around their um, garment that, that will ring. So if the, if the high priest went in and they fell dead because of one sin or the other or whatever they were doing was not accepted by God, People couldn't go in to pull their body. They would just pull the robe and drag them out and bring them outside. So this was going on until Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, came on the scene. And when Jesus came, the Bible says that he died. He uh, showed himself to God, the Father. He ascended on high and said, this, I've shed my blood. I've saved them. I've redeemed them. Their, their sins have been atoned once and for all. So when we read um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, the Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. 
let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. My brother, my sister, Jesus knows your frailties. Jesus knows your weaknesses. He's been where you are. He's walked where you walk. He knows how it feels like to be lied on, accused, betrayed, rejected. Come on, the whole night, yes, he's been there. So don't think that God doesn't understand what you're going through. He does. Because the Bible says that we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. All the temptations you went through, temptation of uh, uh, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and all the pride of life. Jesus went through all those temptations and looked for with, with Satan. Okay? So if you fail, he understands. He can pick you back up. Obtain mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. If you're watching, you have a great high priest. Jesus is forever seated at the right hand of God the Father. He's your high priest. He's standing making intercession for you and I. Praise God. Praise God. So remember that Jesus fulfilled that role. He's a high priest. Praise God. The other scriptures I've listed in the teaching notes, please um, look them over. And get to understand when we talk about Jesus fulfilling, um, you know, that role of a high priest. Number two, Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords. You know, there are scriptures that 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 indicate that. But most importantly, I want to read from Revelation 19, 13 to 16. It says he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on the white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that is with it, he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them. And with a rod of iron, he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. You'll find that the scriptures you've been prophesied from Micah to Zechariah to the New Testament, John, Matthew, Mark, they all prophesied about Jesus, who is the soon coming king, who was going to be a shepherd to rule over Israel. Even at his crucifixion, they wrote on him the title, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Praise God. So Jesus fulfilled that. If you're doing his ethnic ministry, recognized for his kinship, and now in Revelation, the soon coming king, coming to snatch all of us come in for us we'll be wrapped already while we're treating this end time series if you just join you haven't missed a whole lot but definitely go back to the beginning when we get done to watch the video this is episode 45 we are this is on refreshing time episode 45 um end time series this is the false prophet part number two and we are still laying the foundation of the prophets and prophetesses or the prophetic ministry so so far, we've looked at Old Testament uh, prophets and prophetesses, amen, and we are looking at Jesus fulfilling the high priest role, the king, uh, the king, the role of a king, and of course, the role of a prophet. Jesus was and is a prophet. Why? Matthew 21, 11, uh, you know, states that, but let me read this for you. So there are a bunch of scriptures here that I want to touch base because I want to encourage somebody watching me, okay? Now, Matt, uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 4, the Bible says the next day or the next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Of course, everybody knew that Jesus' ministry was miraculous, okay? He healed the sick, delivered the demonized and all kinds of stuff. In fact, you know, he could pray and multiply the fish and the loaves of bread and whatnot. He walked on water. Glory be to God. The Bible says that then they scoffed, they mocked, they ridiculed him and said, he's just a carpenter. The son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, which is Judah, and Simon. And his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere else except in his own hometown among his relative, relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, listen. So, what can we say over here? There are certain things we need to understand. Also, in John 6, 12 to 14, when Jesus multiplied um, the loaves of bread, people were saying, wow, he's truly a prophet. Now, I want you to take notes. If you're taking notes, point number one. You must understand that people will attest to you or confirm your prophetic calling through your proven ministry. The key word is proven ministry. A, an authentic prophet or authentic prophetess, their ministry is proven. How, what do I mean by that? If they see a vision, they have a dream, they give you a prophetic word, it comes to pass. God fulfills it. 
Yes, I know the false prophets are there. I know the counterfeits are there. We are not arguing about them. But I want you to understand that that's one of the things you understand about somebody's prophetic. People can look at you. They've encountered you, encountered your ministry. God has used you mightily to be a blessing to them. They can say for a fact, this is an authentic prophetess of God or prophet of God. And God is using them and God is speaking through them. Glory be to God. So, yes. So we must understand that people will confirm and affirm that. Number two, familiarity can cause people not to honor your prophetic ministry or call upon your life. Who am I talking to? Come on. If it's making sense, you're hearing me, type amen. Let me know you are still with me here. People can get familiar with you. They know you. You are their sister, their brother, mother, father, whatever, cousin, niece. You mentioned it. They know you. You're a family member. They know you as a friend. They've been hanging out with you. In fact, they were. They're rolling with you in the world before you became saved and God called you into ministry. They know your record. They know your past. They, whatever it is, they can get so familiar with you that when God's hand comes mightily upon you and God begins to use you to his glory, they begin to get so familiar. They might not even believe that God has called you. They might even negate the anointing upon your life. Praise God. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. Second Chronicles 20, 20, 20. Say what? We should believe the word of God and we'll be established and believe the prophet and the prophetesses and we will succeed or we will prosper. So if you begin to look down, negate, relegate it, um, you know, um, trash the prophetic unction on somebody, you will never receive any miracle. You will never receive what God has for you. I can tell you for a fact. So don't get familiar. Somebody could be a friend. They could hang out with you. They could laugh with you. But when they start operating in their prophetic office, you have to recognize that. You have to honor that oil upon their life. Don't get familiar. Don't ever get to a place of familiar that you, you fail to begin to relate to that person as a prophet or a prophetess or a man or woman of God. Amen. Number three, unbelief or lack of faith can prevent the flows. Lay hands on a few people and they got healed. He couldn't do much there because Jesus said a prophet is never respected in his own home, in his own hometown, family, nation, whatever. They've gotten so familiar with him because they said, isn't that marriage uh, a son, the carpenter's son? Don't we know his brothers? You know, they got so familiar. So unbelief, not believing that the oil of God upon this person is authentic, authentic and God is using them. Very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. So we've learned that. Make a note of this, very critical, that you must understand that when we talk of the prophetic ministry, even in our day and world, we say Jesus is a high priest, he's a king, he's a prophet. Jesus, from his own words, as we're reading right now, is giving us some, some tidbits into the prophetic ministry. So that if you see people behaving like this, it happened to Jesus too. It happened in his days. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I want us to look at something in scripture. Glory be to God. The word of God says that 2 Corinthians chapter 14, 29 to 33. 2 Corinthians 14, 29 to 33. The word of God said, let two or three people prophesy and let the others evaluate what is said. In other words, let two or three people speak and let others judge. The prophetic always is confirmed in, in, in a company of witnesses. Praise God. The scriptures encourage us. Like you hear a prophetic word. That's why sometimes your maybe your pastor is a prophet or prophetess. They might say a word to you. Another prophet or prophetess who you end up even coming to confirm or affirm it. Or even when a prophetic word is given, if there are other prophets there, God, the Spirit of God will come upon them and they will affirm or confirm what that prophetic word is that has been released onto the church, onto whoever is listening. That's why scripture says that in 2 Corinthians 14, 29. Now verse 30 says, but if, if someone is prophesying and another receives a revelation from the Lord, the one who is speaking must stop. In this way, all who prophesy will have a turn to speak one after the other so that everyone will learn and be encouraged. 32, remember that people who prophesy are in control of their spirit and can take turns. In other words, it says what? Well, that's why you hear the word said what? Well, uh, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If you ever heard that phrase, that's what it means. You're in control. You haven't lost your mind whereby you can't, you can't say, okay, I can't stop. I can't control myself. Come on, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. Like I say, he's gentle. He's, he's sweet. I love the Holy Spirit. My God, what would I do without him? Praise God. So for God is not a God of disorder. Oh, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all meetings of God's holy people, okay, as in all churches of the saints. So what am I saying? So according to 2 Corinthians 14, 29 to 33, the nature or the way we should look at the prophetic office in our time, in our time, so you can understand, anywhere there's confusion or disorder because of the prophetic, there's a big question mark, that's a red flag. 
Because the word of God says that where the spirit of God is, where the prophetic unction is, where the prophets are or prophetesses are and they are ministering and operating, that they, there shouldn't be a, a confusion as to who is saying what and whether what which uh, maybe this prophet, whether this prophet is authentic or not, or whatever he said, is it true or not? It's not confusion. Praise God. And in addition to that, the, spirit, the scriptures make us understand that if you are in a meeting and people are prophesying, there shouldn't be confusion either. Maybe you are prophesying. I should wait for you to find me three people all prophesying at the same time. Who are we going to listen to? That's confusion. That's confusion. So there must be order. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. We must work in an orderly manner in the house of God when it comes to the prophetic ministry. So in the last days, in end times, when you see the pro prophetic in operation and it's breeding confusion and this disorder, nope, there's a big problem right there as you watch it. So I'm giving you something to look out for. Hallelujah. So what can we learn from 2 Corinthians chapter 14, 29 to 33? First thing I want you to understand that the power of witness or agreement in judging a prophetic word. If you get a prophetic word and you're not sure, pray about it and ask God for confirmation. God can use somebody else to confirm. The same way if you give a prophetic word, one or two or what, two or three other prophets may be able to come together and confirm and say, indeed, what you're saying is authentic and it's from God. Number two, multiple people can receive the prophetic word of God at the same time to prophesy. You just have to use restraint. Wait for one person to finish and then you prophesy. So we can be in a meeting. God can give the prophetic word to two, three different people. And we're all going to be true. Number three, there must be order in prophesying. There must be order, no chaos. Number four, God is not the author of confusion. The prophetic word released by his authentic prophets will confirm one another's prophecies. Number five, the prophetic word comes to encourage and comes to edify. Because the Bible says, as we read in, uh, in the verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 14, uh, when we read verse 31, it says what? For you cannot prophesy one by one that all may learn and be encouraged. We're here to prophesy to encourage the people of God and the body of Christ. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Now. I want us to, so having said that, because we are talk, we are looking at the prophets and prophetesses in the New Testament, now that we've said that, I hope it makes sense as we look at some of examples of prophets and prophetesses in the New Testament. Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 36 to 34. When Jesus was born, they took him to the temple to dedicate him. Praise God. Now, when they got to the temple, there was a prophetess there by name Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, Anna. The Bible says she was married for about seven years. And after her husband died, she did never remarried. And she was uh, around 84 years old when she laid her eyes on Jesus, the baby that had brought to the temple. She had been fasting and praying to see the day the Messiah will be revealed in Israel. God preserved her. She didn't see. Death. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of um, Penuel. Of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Verse 38. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him, spoke of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. And so Prophet Hannah was proclaiming the Messiah was there. She was proclaiming that the Messiah was going to come and he had come. And she was speaking. The Bible says she fasted and prayed. A widow, an old widow, an old widow who was a prophetess. We see her during the time of Jesus in the New Testament. Also, when you look at Acts chapter uh, 21, verse 8 to 9, Acts 21, 8 to 9, uh, we talk about the four virgin daughters of the evangelist Philip. When you read Acts 21, 8 to 9, the Bible says, the next day we went to Caesarea and stayed at the home of Philip the evangelist, one of the seven men who had been chosen to distribute food. He had four unmarried daughters, four virgin daughters who had the gift of prophecy. And then another scripture said they prophesied. They, these were prophetic girls. Praise God. Hallelujah. And so we understand that there were four virgin prophetesses, even in the early church. Their father was an evangelist. These girls were prophetesses. They, they carried the prophetic unction upon them. So don't let anybody tell you that the prophetic ended with John the Baptist, okay? Don't let them tell you it ended over the Old Testament. That's a lie. We've seen it, prophetess Anna in the New Testament. We've seen uh, the four virgin daughters of um, the evangelist Philip, praise God, amen. Now, another prophet that is talked about in the New Testament, um, they were, I believe his, his word was shown to us because he prophesied about Apostle Paul's death. 
okay? And we can find his account in Acts chapter 21, verse 10 to 11. Acts 21, 10 to 11. It says, several days later, a man named Agabus, who also had the gift of prophecy, arrived from Judea. He came over, took Paul's belt. He took the belt that Paul was wearing and bound his own feet and hands with it. Then he said, the Holy Spirit declares, so shall the owner of this belt be bound by the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem and turn over to the Gentiles. Okay. And of course, right after that, the, the scriptures following Paul said, don't worry, I'm ready to pour. My life is poured out already. I'm ready to die. I think I've run my race. I'm done. I'm ready to go. Praise God. So look at the way prophet Agabus um, operated in ministry. He took the belt of Paul. Tied his own hands, Prophet Agabus' own hands and legs, and said, whoever this belt belongs to, obviously we know you took the belt from Paul, and said, this is what's going to happen to you. He demonstrated what's going to happen. So like I tell you, God uses prophets and prophetesses different. They all use different signs and tokens to minister. So, you know, it will not always be the same. Like in our time, I'm not going to get somebody's belt and come and tie my hands and say, okay, I'm going to imitate Prophet Agabus. No, God, God will speak to you and use you to operate differently in every situation. So we know of these, at least these three of them, um, Prophetess Anna, the four virgin daughters of uh, Prophetesses, were daughters of Evangelist Philip. And we know of Prophet Agabus in the New Testament. So we know it's not over with. They are still prophets in our time. Now, one, one prophetess who is mentioned, who is false, mm -hmm, she also is featured in the Old Testament, but we see a reference made to her in the book of Revelation, Revelation 2.20. The Bible says, nevertheless, this is what Jesus is saying. I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to teach and seduce my prophets, sorry, my servants, to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Of course, we know um, Jezebel in the Old Testament. We know that her father was a fetish priest. He was a, ba a fetish priest of Baal. Um, so she was the daughter of a fetish priest, okay? We know what Jezebel did when she married Ahab and all the crazy things she did, how she threatened the prophet Elijah to do to him, like what he did to the prophets of Baal. Elijah had to run and go hard until God came and spoke to Elijah. So the Bible references Jezebel as a false prophetess. That spirit of Jezebel is still running rampage in churches where it causes people to commit sexual immorality and also people to partake in idolatry. Praise God. Amen. So at least we know, at least we know of uh, these um, prophetesses, prophets, the nature of the prophetic ministry a little bit to a great extent as we see it in um in the word of God. So now let's take a look at false prophets. False prophets have been there from time immemorial. That spirit of a false prophet has been there in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's always been. And so there are, I mean, there are, there are a lot of scriptures here, but there are some few that I will bring to your attention that God makes mention of it. Okay. God makes mention of it. When you look in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, 1 to 6, God, the children of Israel, there may come among you those who say they've seen visions, they've dreams, they, they work miracles, magic, charms, whatever, and they are not from God. God hasn't sent them. Go read it, Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 6. God says such a person, they must be executed. They must be taken out of the society because they led the people of God astray. They lied to them. So if somebody is uh, a false prophet or operating in that spirit of a false prophet, most of the times their prophecies even don't come to pass. It falls on, 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 on the, you know, it falls to the wayside. They are not called of God. Don't forget the devil can give you visions and dreams. The Bible says the devil can masquerade himself as an angel of light and make you think you are hearing from God, but you are not hearing from God. You would know because of the directions and the way that angel might want to even take worship from you and all kinds of stuff. We know angels are not supposed to receive worship from us. It's only Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. God alone deserves our worship. So yes, um, Deuteronomy 13, 1 to 6, we did in detail, talks about those false prophets and prophetesses when they have false visions and false dreams and try to deceive the people of God. Now I'm reading the second uh, thing you want to look at about the spirit of false prophets. We see that both in the Old and New Testament, but in the, in the Old Testament, we look at Jer Jeremiah 23, 25 to 32. It says, I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name. If I take a note, take note. God said, 
These, those who engage in the false prophetic ministry, those who parade themselves as God's prophet, but they are false prophets, God said they prophesy lies in his name. They can, you can hear them mention Jesus' name, all right? Oh, yeah. They will be prophesying and lying in the name of Jesus. And, and God, the word of God said they are saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? God said, they always say, I've seen a vision. I can, I, they will say, I prophesy with one eye open, with a half eye open, with my two eyes closed, whatever. Like that doesn't move anybody. If you prophesy with one eye open or two eyes open, what, what is that? <laughs> what is that supposed to be? Okay, so listen, let's be serious about this. Okay, God said, they will say they've dreamed this, they've seen that, they had a vision, blah, blah, blah. That is not what is going to make it authentic. Okay, glory be to God. That's not what makes it authentic. Okay, you can, you can tell me you're prophesying with your head down, your legs up, whatever. Just declare the word of God. You know, sometimes people 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 do the most. They go beyond and above and say things that are, that just cracks me up. I'm sorry, that's why I'm laughing. Anyway, so uh, and then God says, indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. So they are false prophets. They speak lies. They have a lying spirit, a lying tongue. They are not speaking because God has given them a prophetic word, but they want to do that just to deceive people for their own gain. The Bible says, who tried to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone tells his neighbor as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. So God said those who worship Baal or Baal, however you call him in the Old Testament, he said those lying prophets that time turn people away from remembering the name of the Lord our God. Turn people away away from having an, an authentic relationship with God. A true prophet will turn you to God. A true prophet is not going to tell you, let's go and seek marine spirit. Let's go to the Oka. Let's go to the beach. Let's go under the ocean. Let's go in the jungle, swallow five eggs, somersault in God, pepper and tomatoes and God knows what. Drink some chlorine, eat some grass. You can eat serpent and think it's chicken. Listen, all those crazy people are false prophets. Come on, open your eyes. Even a little child can tell that is that is fake. That's a fake prophet. That's fake behavior that you see out there. Praise God. And the Bible said, the prophet who has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? Says the Lord. Is not my word like a fire? Says the Lord. And like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. So the word of God, the prophetic word can come to chasten. It can come to rebuke. It can come to break down. It can come to build. Because remember what God told the prophet Jeremiah. I've given you a purpose. Jeremiah 1, 9 to 10. He said, I want you to pull down, root out, build and plant. Come on, somebody. So it is important. You have to understand that God's word, when the prophetic word of God comes, ask yourself, is it coming to uh, pull down? Is it coming to root out the old, the bad, the evil? Is it coming to, to build? Is it coming to plant? Glory be to God. Look at verse 30. So we are still in Jeremiah 23, 30. Therefore, God says, I am against the prophets, says the Lord, who steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. So I've seen where on, even sometimes on social media, some maybe a prophet might come out and give a prophetic word. And it's like, you see five, six people go and take, they will go and listen to the person's prophecies. Follow maybe the ministry, take the prophetic word verbatim and try to repeat it like they said it. And God forbid if you're repeating a false prophet. Come on, somebody. God said, I'm against those who do that. I haven't given you a word. And because you don't have a word, you go and take somebody's prophecy and come and say, oh, God said, God didn't send you. You sent yourself. Amen. The Bible says, and said, behold, I'm against those who prophesy false dreams. You haven't seen, you said you've seen. You didn't share a vision. You said you've seen. Why? Because you're hungry. You think if you give them a false prophet prophecy, a false prophetic word, they can empty their coffers, give you all the money in their bank account and in their bags because you said you saw. Listen, children of God, you have to have the gift of discerning of spirits to discern and know if somebody's lying or not. If somebody is prophet lying, that's what I call it. They, they're not prophesying, prophet lie. <laughs> they're prophet lying. Okay, they lie. They, they're speaking like God sent them, but God never sent them. They're lying to you. Glory be to God. Amen. And so that's what we talk about. God said, and the Lord said in his word, he said, uh, I'm against those who do that. He said, because tell them and cause my people to err by their lies and by their recklessness. Yet I did not send them or command them. Therefore, they shall not profit these people at all, says the Lord. God is saying, the people lie. They lie. Why? Do you like God said you cause people like your false prophetic moves and prophetic way of doing things will cause people to be reckless? 
You didn't see. You said you said. You saw. You said God said. God didn't say nothing. Stop copying people's prophecies. Stop copying verbatim. Stop copying. Even stop paraphrasing it. Get your own prophetic word from God. Let God speak to you in visions and in dreams. Believe you me, the devil can masquerade and give you a false dream and a false vision. I've seen it before. Glory be to God. So what am I telling you? God said he's against all these false prophets. If you want to understand end time, what will happen with the false prophet, then you must understand that the spirit of the false prophet is already in the world. It's talked about in the Old Testament. It's talked about in the New Testament. We've seen them in the old. They lied. They lied. I kid you not. They have a lying tongue. A lying spirit is upon them, and they will lie, and it causes people to live recklessly. Don't let a false prophet lead you to hell. Don't follow them. Sometimes I think people lost their reasoning. You, you, you don't lost your mind. Because sometimes the prophetic directions they're giving you, the prophet says, come and let me give you a bath. I need you, a prophet giving a married woman a bath. Now, what kind of God who sits up there says, I'm against adultery, I'm against fornication, I'm against sexual morality, will be the same God who will give a prophet or a prophet a direction to give you a bath or shave your pubic hair? Oh, yeah, I went there. They're crazy. Come on, somebody. What's going on in these churches? You see a prophet and they want to give people that they want to operate like I said, they have the word of knowledge. And some of them use sorcery, divination. We'll get to that part because that's what will lead us into understanding what the false prophet um, in the end times is going to do. They use divination, which is sorcery or witchcraft. And familiar spirit, don't forget familiar spirit, they're always around you. They're in the bloodline. They go back into centuries. Somebody can tap and begin to use a familiar spirit to tell you when you woke up this morning, the time you woke up, what you ate, what you peeled out, what you said, where you went, what you thought. They could do all that. And you're like, oh, my God, he's a prophet. Should have brought this Discern and know. Discern and know. I'm not saying that true and authentic prophets don't operate. We all operate that way. But you should know that the devil can mimic it. And if you don't have the gift of discernment of spirits or discernment, you can never tell the, the real deal from the fake. God said, Deuteronomy, I'm sorry, in uh, Jeremiah, just as we read, he said they, they, they lie. They take people's money. Go and sell your house. Go and sell all your cars. And people then become broke and they are homeless and they have nothing because you, the lying prophet, gave them a lie and they showed all their belongings and now they are wretched and poor. Where is your head, child of God, woman of God, man of God, servant of God, children of God? Let's use, uh, uh, let's use our brains, use your wisdom. And of course, allow the Holy Spirit to direct you. If somebody's telling you to do any prophetic direction, ask God first. Ask God first because their lies can wreck your life. I can tell you that. So we are still looking at what? The false, um, the spirit of the false prophets that are in the world in Bible days and even now. So. First Kings chapter 13 is a case scenario. Praise God. I would not have time to break it down, but it's a case scenario. First Kings 13, 1 to 30, read all of that. But I'll be focusing on verse 11 to 15. The Bible talks about a genuine prophet, an authentic prophet that God gave a prophetic word to give to the king. And God sent him and said, okay, you're going. You're going to see the king. You're going to give a prophetic word. God told him specifically, when you go, don't stay in anybody's house, don't eat anybody's food, don't drink anything, don't take gifts, nothing. Go and deliver the word, and when you're done, turn and come back home. This prophet got there, and there was an old prophet in that city. His son told him what had happened and transpired. This prophet saddled the donkey and went after the authentic prophet of God. And said, hey, you know, I heard this and that. You came to town, that happened. And he said, oh, um, an angel of the Lord revealed to me to come and tell you this prophetic word that you need to come with me to my house and I need to refresh you. And, and, and the authentic prophet said, God say, listen to me, somebody. When God has called you, when God has told you something, God say it, obey God, be a God pleaser and not a people pleaser. Do what God is telling you to do. Deliver it. Don't add and don't take out. Listen, it's dangerous as a prophet or prophetess of God to add to what God has told you to say or take out from what God is asking you to say. You need to come under the full authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God, and allow the Holy Spirit to grant you utterance. Don't say anything God hasn't said. This lying old prophet we see from 1 Kings 13, lied and convinced the authentic prophet, he also followed him home. Went to his house, ate, drank, 
did everything. And when it was done, then the old prophet who lied to him, that the angel of God told him, began to now speak the authentic prophetic word of God and say, because you disobeyed, you don't make it home. You're going to die. Come on, somebody. That is diabolical. Like when I think about it, why did that old prophet even do that? Was it jealousy? What was it? Be careful. If you're a prophet or prophetess yourself, man or woman of God, be careful what other, other men and women of God speak into your life and what other prophets speak into and over your life. One second, they're operating uh, in the rule prophetic. The next minute, they are prophesying with a lying tongue. What is that? What is that? You have to discern and know what they are saying. You have to discern and know. This discerning thing we are talking about is no joke. Because if not, you'll be so confused. You might think everybody's a false prophet. You know, you, no, it's not. You will know. That's why I always tell people, know the word of God and have a deep relationship with the Holy Spirit. When something doesn't sit right, you, your spirit man will bear witness with the spirit of God that resides in you. The Holy Spirit will bear witness. And you know that this doesn't pass a smell test. Come on, somebody. Doesn't pass a smell test. Hallelujah. So we know about the case of the old lion prophet. First Kings chapter 13, 1 to 30. Read that scripture. And indeed, that prophet also died. He never made it home. He ended the life of that authentic, genuine prophet prematurely because of disobedience. You cannot walk in disobedience. I cannot walk in disobedience. We must obey the voice of God. We must obey what God is saying to us. Don't compromise. Because sometimes God might say something and it's not comfortable. You might not like it. You want to hear something, something that is exciting to your ears, something that makes you feel like, okay, this sounds better. This is more comfortable. And if you don't take care, you might disobey God. Tarry with the Lord. Walk with God. Wait for God. Let God perform his own word in your life. Glory be to God. Amen. Amen. And so I would like to end on this note. This is part number two. If we join later, this is end time series. Episode 45, False Prophet, The False Prophet, Part 2. What we've been doing all along is laying the foundation so that you understand what a true prophetic ministry looks like, what a, a false prophet looks like, what a true prophet looks like. I'm equipping you with the knowledge of some of the prophets and prophetesses from the Old Testament that we call the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible and also in the New Testament. So if you're a woman of God out there, prophetess, don't ever let somebody look down on you and say woman, a woman cannot be a prophetess. You are a prophetess. God called you. It happened in Bible days. It happened during the early church. It's happening in our time. Embrace your calling. Rise, shine, you know, for God's glory is risen upon you and declare the prophetic word of God boldly to your family, your community, your church, the nation. Don't let anybody stifle you. Don't let anybody look down on you. Don't let anybody trash your ministry. You are called of God. You are anointed of God. And if you are in preparation, God is getting ready to unveil you to the world. Don't resort to fake powers. Don't resort to the, uh, the, the uh, worship of fallen angels. You don't need all that to be a prophet or prophetess. God can authentically use you. God can work miracles through you. God can endow you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit to work miracles, to speak as his mouthpiece. Be that seer that God has called you into our generation. So I thank you for watching today. Now, in part three, which is episode four, it's just coming up, God willing, next week, Tuesday. My God would look at the typical behavior of the spirit of the false prophets. We'll be looking at Ezekiel 13. You can read it ahead of time. And then we'll look at the false prophet himself. He's part of the unholy trinity. The dragon, the antichrist or antichrist, and the false prophet. Because now that you have the foundation teaching and understanding, when we start talking about what the false prophet will be doing in the end times, it will make so much sense. Because we looked at it in scripture. Scripture authenticates that. It confirms it. So that you will be knowledgeable about it. God bless you for coming. I love and appreciate all of you. This is Lady Rev. Rosin over here on Refreshing Time. I'm signing off. Have a wonderful rest of the week and a blessed weekend. Thank you, our YouTube um, participants and audience.